a big thank you to all my patrons who support the Engineered Mind podcast. Hi and welcome to the Engineered Mind podcast. In this podcast we cover topics such as engineering, artificial intelligence, neuroscience and other interesting topics to educate, inspire and engineer people's minds all around the world. I'm your host Yosef and for this special podcast episode number 50, I'm very happy to welcome Steve Brunton to my show. Dr. Brunton's research focuses on combining techniques in dimensionality reduction, sparse sensing and machine learning for the data-driven discovery and control of complex dynamical systems. He is also interested in how low-rank coherent patterns that underlie high-dimensional data facilitate sparse measurements and optimal sensor and actuator placement for control. He is developing adaptive controllers in an equation-free context using machine learning. Specific applications in fluid dynamics include closed-loop turbulence control for mixing enhancement, biolocomotion, and renewable energy. Other applications include neuroscience, medical data analysis, network dynamical systems, and optical systems. In this really interesting podcast, Steve and I talked about his book, which he wrote together with Nathan Kutz, machine learning for fluid mechanics, where to get data from and work with own data, loss functions and implications for physical interpretability, reduced order models, reinforcement learning, and much more. For updates on upcoming podcast projects and videos, make sure to follow me on Twitter as well as on Instagram. To join my weekly newsletter, ingenetmind.sh, where I share exclusive content, visit yusef.substack.com. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my podcast with the awesome Steve Brunton. So it's great to have you on my podcast, Steve. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on the show. First of all, welcome. Hi, really glad to be here. So as always, we get uh, we kick things off with you giving us like a one or two minute bio. Who is Steve? What does he do? And why AI? Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Steve Brunton. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Washington. And my lab, kind of in a nutshell, applies modern machine learning techniques and applied optimization to classical engineering problems like dynamical systems and control, especially targeting uh, systems in fluid mechanics, which is one of my passions. And so it's been kind of a long and circuitous path uh, to get to where I'm at now. Um, but throughout my entire career, uh, kind of one of the themes is that I've had one foot in engineering and one foot in mathematics or applied mathematics. And so I started off, um, actually, I guess even before undergrad um, in high school, I, I grew up in Texas. And there's a really uh, fantastic magnet program in Texas called the Texas Academy of Math and Science, where uh, high school students can go to the University of North Texas in Denton and live there for two years. And so that was just a fantastic experience for me uh, when I was you know, just a kid. Uh, then I went to Caltech for my undergrad and studied pure math. And I didn't quite realize that what I thought of as math and what they thought of as math were pretty different things. Um, so, you know, sometimes the more pure a math department, the more uh, pride they take in being separated from any applications at all. Uh, and so to some extent, I was kind of rescued early on in my uh, math undergrad by Jerry Marsden, who is in control and dynamical systems. And, you know, Jerry was an absolutely phenomenal mathematician, but he loved taking his math and applying it to every system he could find, uh, fluids, planetary dynamics, you name it. And so I really found my passion for applied math for dynamical systems and control. Uh, I worked a lot on the three body problem, which uh, when I, whenever I've heard in my career that there was an unsolved problem or a problem where there was controversy, that's always what I wanted to work on. Um, and so for me, the three body problem was kind of the first uh, in that in that series of problems. And after my undergrad degree, uh, I went to Princeton for mechanical and aerospace engineering for my, my PhD. Uh, and I was working with Clancy Rowley there. And so it was a bit of a shift from what I was doing before in kind of pure math and applied math to, you know, very much engineering fluid mechanics. How do small wings generate lift, uh, kind of unsteady fluid dynamics? And it's, it's truly fascinating stuff. I love it. Uh, and I have never regretted kind of going into the uh, engineering world of fluids. Um, the way I actually decided, this is kind of a joke between my wife and me, this is not really how we decided, but we were, you know, sitting at lunch one day trying to decide where we were both going to go for grad school and what fields. Um, Cause I actually applied mostly to applied math programs. 
and I was drinking a bowl of miso soup and I was looking at the, you know, eddies in the, in the particles. And I realized that this is so much more interesting than anything I was working on in kind of pure or applied math. And I really needed to uh, get my, my feet wet kind of, and go work on something really applied in fluids. Um, so in, uh, in Princeton, I really developed this kind of engineering half of, of my world and my mind, um, which again, I found very satisfying. It was not easy at first to build those, those chops. I had never taken a fluids class when I went to grad school. Again, I took very pure math uh, classes, so I didn't know, you know, I'd never taken a PDE class, actually. Um, so that was, you know, all brand new in grad school. Uh, and so I, I just really enjoyed that a lot. Then uh, after our PhDs, Bing and I moved to the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where I had an acting assistant professorship in the applied math department, which is um, essentially like a non-tenure track uh, it's kind of a glorified postdoc uh, instructorship. And after two years, I applied to the mechanical engineering department and got my tenure track job here. Um, and so I've been here ever since, since uh, 2014 in this department. Uh, and I just absolutely love, you know, working with my collaborators and students on these interesting problems. Most of my students are kind of spread out throughout campus from mechanical engineering, applied math, physics, um, I collaborate very closely with a number of people on campus, Nathan Kutz in Applied Math, uh, my wife Bing Brenton in Biology, among others. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the nutshell of how I got here. Mm -hmm. Very detailed. And because you ma mentioned Nathan Kutz, I have, of course, the book right here. So everybody who is watching this in video format now, um, Data Driven Science and Engineering. What was the motiv motivation to write this book? To make knowledge more accessible or make it because me as an engineer, we have like three semesters of ma mathematics, but it's not in depth. You learn some things, some basics, maybe go a little bit here into depth. What was the motivation for you to, to make this accessible? You know, it's hard to say to pin it down to one thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, first off, having a fantastic co-author like Nathan makes these things a lot easier. <laughs> um, so Nathan's great to work with. We've been friends for a long time and collaborators, um, and we see eye to eye on a lot of things, which makes it you know, instead of there being conflicts that come up, usually we're kind of simpatico on these things. Um, in terms of motivation, I know both of us are just drawn to writing. Like, I'm just not happy when I'm not writing pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, and communicating science in general. So teaching and writing and communicating is, for me, this kind of other half of my scientific and engineering world. Um, so, you know, most of the book was written in nights and weekends. This is not something where, you know, <laughs> carved out time during my work day. This was really extra because, you know, we love doing this. And we have, you know, each of us have large groups and a lot of uh, overlap in our students that we co-advise. And so also there's a pretty big motivation just to have, you know, a book or a series of lectures that kind of can level set the students, not just in our labs, but coming into the University of Washington. So. You know, when you come here, there's such a um, kind of buzz and excitement around machine learning and these modern techniques. And so really, you know, we want to make sure that our engineering students are getting that just top, top notch uh, education so that, you know, they get the jobs they want. They are prepared to, you know, really do the exciting things, uh, not just in computer science fields, but in engineering fields, uh, you know, at Boeing and, and places like that. So. A lot of motivations. I think really, if it comes down to it, it's like a pathological need to write um, at the end of the day. Yeah. Mm, well put, Steve. Um, also, a lot of people contact me for, before this po podcast and wanted to know um, what advice you would give them. Would you advise them maybe to get your book or where would you advise people to get started if they want to combine engineering knowledge plus machine learning, especially for fluid mechanics? Yeah. Um, so the... That's a really good question. And there's not, you know, a one stop shop for, for that, especially for fluid mechanics at the moment. Um, you know, we tried to make our book as self-contained as possible. So we assume relatively little about the background. You know, you should know what an ordinary differential equation is. And, you know, you should have some computer literacy, at least in, you know, MATLAB or Python. Um, but really, we wanted to make it so that uh, with a relatively, you know, minor assumptions on background, you can get up to speed in these kind of interesting research topics. Um, I have always, you know, I don't want to 
it feels a little shameless to suggest that someone just goes and buys our book. I think that's, you know, I don't, it costs money. And um, so, you know, we have a free version on our website. If you go to databookuw.com, that's like where all of the resources are. We have our videos linked there. And if you go to slash databook.pdf, you can get the whole book for free. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a nice way to try it out. See if you like it before you drop 50 bucks, you know, on Amazon. Cause I don't, you know, I want anyone who wants to read the book, I want them to be able to read the book, even if they can't afford it. So, um, and also I think that's kind of our philosophy on the YouTube channel too, is, you know, all of these lectures are on either Nathan's or my YouTube channels. Mm -hmm. And so you don't even really need the book. It's all there. Um, if you want it. Mm -hmm. uh, I love the altruism, Steve. I appreciate it. <laughs> Um, the thing is also the way you explain things, and, and I have to say, because a lot of people have their favorite channels on YouTube, how people explain things. And I was at uni, I know how professors who are very well versed in their topic, or ex top, for example, turbulence or fluid mechanics in general, that it's quite hard for them to explain things in a very understandable manner. And you do that in an excellent way, same as your colleague Nathan. And uh, props for that, Steve. I have to tell you that it's really, really good job. And the quality also cranked up over time. Like when I s saw your first videos, like if I scroll down all the way to the bottom and then having this all set up with a black background and with a glass and people assuming that you can write from the wrong side to the right side. Yeah. You know, th thank you very much, first of all. Um, yeah, the increase in production value has been just awesome from our side, right? Like when you make these videos, you put a lot of time in and so you really want them to be nice and something that is visually kind of engaging and pulls in the audience so that they feel kind of that they're there with you. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, it's actually been years. So um, I remember uh, the first light board was built in this tiny little closet, you know, essentially almost in the attic of the applied math building, no windows, which is what we wanted. Um, this thing got up to 110 degrees in the summer, which is when we did a lot of our early filming. <laughs> because there was no ventilation. Um, I, I remember Nathan took a trip to visit another university and he came back and he was just set on this light board because it was, you know, this new kind of forward facing, engaging medium. Uh, and so he drove the kind of building of that first light board. I helped a little. Um, and then after a couple of years, uh, we convinced Boeing to buy us like a brand new state of the art studio um, that our lab manager, Derek Franz, is like, together. I mean, this was a labor of love. He sourced out every piece and, you know, uh, specked out the room and we just couldn't be happier. I mean, it's absolutely, you know, it's super fun. It's a one, one man job. You can go in in the morning, it's on in five minutes and you're ready to go. So it's pretty cool. That's incredible. Um, also what we want, maybe we come to that at a later point, but we, what we also want to cover is, for example, the title of your book is data driven. We want to talk about data, but also because my audience is interested in AI plus fluid mechanics or solid Ooh. mechanics, where would you start or what is the, what are the steps involved if you want to jump into the field? Let's say we have a three slash four step process and it starts all with data. What are the complications with data? Where do you get them from? How can you potentially create your own data, for example? Yeah, specifically for fluid dynamics. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. So fluid dynamics, I I mean, this, is, this sounds like a sound bite, but like fluid dynamics really is one of the original big data fields. In fluids, we were generating just you know, terabytes of data when everyone else was dealing with gigabytes of data. I mean, this was always a huge uh, pushing the limits of computation, of high performance computing, of data. So a lot of modern architectures that are just you know, standard in the machine learning world actually came from fluid mechanics to run these huge simulations, to transport data, to process data. Um, so, I mean, I guess I personally really like the historical aspect of this. I think that's important to remember where these things came from. Um, and, you know, that means really good fundamentals in linear algebra, statistics, and optimization. And mm -hmm. you can't you can't skip those steps and just go right to, you know, scikit-learn <laughs> Uh, with your fluids data because you know you need to know where things are coming from. So in terms of getting your own data, um, so I consider myself extremely fortunate to have great collaborators. <laughs> and you know I, I run you know toy simulations on my laptop, really low Reynolds number flows, low past a cylinder, things like that. Um, you know I'm a pretty simple programmer myself. I like toy systems, uh, and so to really engage in a more 
rich and interesting set of fluids problems, I rely on fantastic collaborators from across the world. And these are experimental collaborators, numerical collaborators. Um, and so, I mean, those are the two big data sources, right? High performance computing simulations, um, you know, either direct numerical simulations or, or CFD and uh, large scale experiments. Um, so the Johns Hopkins turbulence data set is a really nice repository to just download data for free and kind of get your hands dirty. Um, I also really like the sea surface temperature data. It's not exactly a fluid, it's you know the temperature of the sea surface, but it's a very high resolution spatial temporal field. Mm -hmm. um, there's one called HICOM, I think it's H-Y-C-O-M, mm -hmm. uh, and I forget if it's NASA or NOAA, but it's basically um, this global circulation model of the sea surface velocity field. And I mean, it is stunning resolution and detail. You can look at the entire earth and every eddy on it for years at high resolution in time and space. You can zoom into the Gulf of Mexico and watch a hurricane form. I mean, it's just absolutely fantastic. It's hard to download because it's so big. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, my PhD student, Jared Callahan, kind of downloaded a big chunk of that for our lab to use. And so we have, you know, a server in our lab where we have a few choice data sets that we can adding to uh, kind of our portfolio. Got it. So if, if anybody maybe has not the power or access to such big data sets um, or wants to work with his own, let's say we're working on a flow past the cylinder slash common vortex street, how would the steps look like? How, how would you suggest like investigating these data? If you, if you want to do an own simulation, let's say you use open form, for example, and yeah. then you use, uh, use any machine learning techniques on it, would be would be the next logical step in this process? Yeah, so there's there's a few approaches, um, and I actually would recommend um, there's this immersed boundary projection method that was um, well. So the code that we use essentially was originally developed by Tim Colonius and Sam Tyra, mm -hmm. and then it was ported to C++ by uh, Clancy Rowley at Princeton. And it's a really nice modular code. You can you know run different solvers, different geometries. You can have moving boundaries, and it's like it's just like a little laboratory you can get working on your laptop. So mm -hmm. uh, really easy. And so there's kind of two approaches once you have a simulation like this working, generating data. One is to dump that data into you know, some kind of a generic file structure and then pull it into Python or MATLAB uh, so that you kind of have this firewall between you know, your C++ code or Fortran code where you're generating your fluid. And then you have... Um, you know, kind of your ML tools that you're post-processing on that data. And I would say that in some sense, that's actually the easiest approach oftentimes, um, you know, to just get the data, dump the data, load the data, do ML on the data. But it's maybe not the most rewarding approach. So what's even more rewarding is that if you can, you know, if you can have your code in something like Python or Julia, either, you know, maybe it's wrapped C code or wrapped Fortran code, it's really nice if during the simulation you can be continuously running these machine learning techniques. And this is a, a phrase I got from my close collaborator, Baron Nowak, which is that you know, many machine learning tasks and also many fluids tasks uh, in industry are post-mortem. So you run your data, you collect your data, and you analyze your data, but it's, it's basically dead at this point. It's not like from a living simulation anymore. Mm. But a lot of what we want to do, like uh, flow control, so if you want to manipulate the fluid and change its behavior for some you know, engineering outcome, you really need that learning and those, uh, those kind of extra steps to be in the loop of the flow solver. And that's a lot harder to do, to kind of get into the guts of the code and you know, pull out the fields independently instead of just getting the solution, getting the independent you know, gradients or diffusion terms or things like that. Um, but that can be extremely rewarding if you do that. Mm -hmm. So what methods are you especially using, let's say you have a turbulent field or any simulation data, how would you approach, what would be the next step? What, is the, what are the interesting quantities for you in particular? Well, so I like to model and control complex systems. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you mentioned how do we do this on a laptop if we don't have the big computing power to run these, these big simulations. And I would argue that most of the reason we need such large computing power for these simulations is because we're using very uh, 
either naive or generic discretizations of our data. So I have my fluid field and you know, to simulate it in a computer, I chop it into a million or a billion degrees of freedom, ordinary differential equation. And I'm simulating all of those million coupled ordinary differential equations, very expensive. So for me, the most important two steps in modeling any fluid with uh, machine learning is pattern extraction. So mm -hmm. getting some low dimensional representation of what are the patterns in the data that matter? What are the coherent structures? Where is the energy? Where are the dynamics happening? You know, in this million degree of freedom system, not every one of those million degrees of freedoms matter. Okay, so I think about like an eagle flying. You can picture all of the turbulence it's experiencing and you know, for us to simulate this would be just mind bogglingly complex. But the eagle is able to do this, you know, very naturally because oh, out of the millions of, of degrees of freedom, there are large coherent structures on its wings that it cares about for its daily life, for turning, for flying, for landing, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for us as engineers, automating that pattern extraction procedure, so finding low dimensional coordinates that describe our data, and then building models of how those low dimensional coordinates interact, how energy is exchanged, what the dynamics are, so that we can predict, estimate, and control that system. And this is, um, you know, so I, again, I love history. I think that you can really only understand modern developments in the context of historical uh, advances in science and mm -hmm. engineering. And so if you think about it, all almost of mathematical, uh, mathematical physics and uh, mathematical engineering over the past, not just hundreds of years, but centuries, like all the way back to the, the Greeks and the Romans and most likely before, the advances that were made were because of the introduction of good coordinate systems. Uh, so, for example, right, the, the Fourier transform is a good coordinate system that diagonalizes the heat equation, that makes the heat equation kind of, it's an eigenvector coordinate system mm -hmm. for the heat equation, so it decouples everything. Um, if you think about Newton and Kepler, they were able to uh, develop this new physics because of the Copernican system that put the sun at the center of the solar system instead of the earth. And so, you know, throughout history, there have been these moments where a new coordinate system opened up a new physics, a new, a new model, you know, uh, Einstein's relativity, quantum mechanics, all of this came from a new coordinate representation. And that's exactly the case in fluids also. In, in any complex system in the modern era with machine learning, you know, now we're talking about really complex systems. We're not going to be able to boil it down to three letters E equals MC squared or F equals MA. It's going to be more complicated, but we're still trying to extract the key patterns, the key mm -hmm. coordinates in this high dimensional data so that we can build the simplest models, the most uh, kind of, you know, parsimonious or, or useful models possible. Um, yeah, and, and, and there's a really rich history in fluid mechanics of this. So, um, you know, we're used to thinking about, um, so the singular value decomposition or principal components analysis or proper orthogonal decomposition, they're all the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way of taking high dimensional data, like a bunch of examples of human faces and finding a low dimensional representation that can approximate all of those faces. Um, and what's really interesting, this is kind of a backbone method in machine learning, is linear dimensionality reduction. So deep autoencoders are nonlinear generalizations of linear principal components analysis. And in 1987, Sirovich, um, a great kind of applied mathematician and fluid mechanician, introduced this algorithm in fluid mechanics and for human face recognition. In the same year, 1987, he introduced the eigenfaces algorithm, which is essentially you take a bunch of faces and you take the SVD of that library of faces and you get these eigenfaces. And he similarly showed that you can use the SVD to get eigenflow fields for turbulent flu fluids. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this wasn't that long ago. This sparked a huge advance in image sciences and in fluid mechanics. And so they're very closely related, these kind of advances in pattern extraction and dimensionality reduction. 
Uh, so you basically have this triangle of machine learning, image recognition, and fluid mechanics, which is kind of feeding each other in some sense. That's exactly right. And, you know, a lot of the low-hanging fruit in machine learning uh, for fluid mechanics is, in fact, I would recommend the first thing you always try is try to think of your fluid as an image sequence. Because, mm -hmm. I, mean, like, I mean, I don't know, I have these fluids behind me. They look like images. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, of course, they have physics. Of course, they have F equals MA and conservation laws. And there's more to them. They're not just, you know, just images. But right off the bat, if you think about them like images, you can do a ton uh, of kind of easy ML right off the bat. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, do you also have that covered in your book with the eigenfaces or like image um, image recognition or image using mathematics to uh, manipulate images? Yeah, absolutely. So this is even in the first chapter. So the first chapter, we we didn't want to start off too heavy with like just jump right into, mm -hmm. you know, not with your Schrodinger equation or maybe your Stokes. Um, and so we started off with just image analysis. Everybody can take a picture on their phone pull it into, you know, Python and take the SVD. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of where we started was a picture of my dog, Mort, uh, playing in the snow and just seeing what you could do with these different techniques. Yeah, I love it. And of course, I will put the link to your book uh, in the description, cool. the free version and, of course, the other version as well. Um, okay. We have data somehow covered. And the next step then would be in this four-step process is designing the architecture. You have it a little bit covered, but how would you approach this step, designing the architecture per se? really an exciting area because it's not it's not settled yet mm -hmm. so if you ask uh 10 different researchers you'll get 10 different answers on this question um which i think is a good hallmark that this is an interesting question um in terms of the architecture i have a couple of personal favorites again because i want to extract these low dimensional representations low dimensional patterns i you know as a puny human who can only see in three dimensions am highly biased to low dimensional representations. That's where, you know, our minds are naturally geared to working the best. Um, and I just fundamentally believe that if you want to get representations that are interpretable and that generalize, and the only models we've ever built that are interpretable and generalized are physics models. That's almost the definition of a physics model is something mm -hmm. that generalizes and hopefully is interpretable because you yeah. have units on things. Um, and I think the way to do that mathematically uh, with machine learning is through these kind of autoencoder networks where you start off with a high dimensional input layer. Maybe this is, you know, your high dimensional flow field or some, you know, lightly compressed version of that flow field. And you're trying to choke it down to as few variables as possible so that when you re-expand out to the original dimension, yeah. You can, you can uh, reproduce the original field faithfully with as few latent variables in the middle as possible. This is just a beautiful way of pulling out those key features. And it's nice because it connects to the intuition and to the decades of experience we have in fluids of using linear dimensionality reduction, like the singular value decomposition, like principal components. I mean, that's bread and butter stuff for us. We've been doing that for 40, 50 years. Mm -hmm. And this is the nonlinear generalization. Like these are the big guns that allow you to do that better uh, with machine learning or these nonlinear deep autoencoders. And there's, you know, add-ons that you can use to make them more, uh, more general to larger systems or to systems with symmetries or self-similarities. You can have convolutional autoencoders. So you're looking for self-similarity and compression. Uh, you can have variational autoencoders, so you're adding this kind of stochastic or statistical element, and you're drawing from ensembles. Uh, uh, you're drawing from an ensemble or a distribution of possible flow fields. Um, and you know, there's there's amazing researchers all across the world working on all of these architectures, trying to figure out not just what's the architecture that works. But how to make it more physical, how to bake in, is there a Hamiltonian structure? Is there a conservation of energy? Can I build in rotation and translation and self-similarity so that by construction in the architecture itself, it has these invariances? Um, so that's a big one. Um, of course, convolutions are good for things that are like images and have translational and scale self-similarity. Um, Autoencoders are good for compression and interpretable latent spaces. Mm -hmm. um, recurrent architectures, I think, are absolutely critical. We're talking about dynamical systems. 
And so we need to have this feedback element to capture the kind of time history if we're not measuring everything. Uh, so, you know, things like uh, LSTMs. Um, I think LSTMs have some key issues, but, you know, that family of, uh, of architecture can be quite useful. And, you know, what we do a lot in my lab is uh, we take these, these general architectures, let's say like a, an autoencoder, and we try to add custom loss functions in that middle layer on that latent variable to make it more physical, maybe to add in dynamics so that it has to be dynamically consistent from snapshot to snapshot, or it has to be as linear as possible. Can I find a coordinate transformation that makes my dynamics look linear? Uh, things like that. And, you know, it's challenging enough to train these things without those additional loss functions to make it physical. So it's sometimes more challenging to make these physical but usually highly rewarding. Yeah, that's what I actually wanted to talk about next, which is we have the data, we have the architecture, and then the next step would be the, uh, defining the loss function. And there is a lot of critics saying these neural networks or these things we are working with don't understand physics. And that's why we have, you mentioned the loss functions. Um, how would you model such a loss function? You alluded to a bit, but uh, maybe you can go in a little bit to depth. Yeah, there, there's a lot of options. Um, so, yeah, so, so you can, so essentially you're trying to solve a very, very high dimensional regression problem. You're trying to solve for a bunch of coefficients that best fit, you know, your data in some norm, right? Mm -hmm. And so there are lots of choices of that norm of what, how you measure goodness of solution. Is the goodness of solution just how faithfully I reconstruct the input output data? You know, a lot of times that's all you, you do. Maybe sometimes you add an L1 penalty so you don't get coefficients that are too large or outliers of your data that are too large, things like that. So you're going to um, you know, try to do things like that. Um, but I think it's really interesting when you start adding in these additional terms of your loss function that are tailored to make your system more physical. Um, and so in physics or in uh, computational mathematics, we call these regularizing terms, right? So, you know, I have some optimization problem or some regression problem, and maybe it's ill-posed or it likely, maybe there's infinite many solutions and I don't know how to pick the right one where right is subjective. And so oftentimes we will add in these regularizers, additional terms in the loss function that kind of smooth out your optimization and help you find a good uh, optimal point. And so there's a few things you look for in a regularizer. Sometimes you're looking for regularizers that make your optimization problem more well posed. Uh, but also you are usually putting in some physical prior knowledge, whether you believe it or not, whether you know that you're doing this or not, when you add a regularizing term, you are putting in prior knowledge about what you expect the solution, the right solution to look like, whether it's sparse or small radius or symmetric or rotationally invariant or whatever you think the solution should be, you're kind of encoding that information in that regularizing term. So there's actually this really interesting, um, you know, Bayesian perspective to these regularizers that you have priors that you are imposing uh, on this optimization by adding these regularizers. So there's formal ways of, uh, of going back and forth from your regularizer to your priors. And if you have a prior, figuring out the regularizer and things like that. I'm, I'm dancing around your question. It's a hard question. Um, to some extent, I would recommend writing down the optimization problem you actually want to solve. And it's usually not going to be solvable. Mm -hmm. And then you can take the terms that are non-convex and that are giving you trouble and you can relax them to nearby kind of terms or norms or regularizers that are solvable. And so that, that's usually the strategy nowadays. And this, did not, this was not the strategy, you know, 20 years ago as much, is now we have such good commodity optimization techniques and relaxations that you can write down a really airy optimization and probably find a nearby uh, kind of loss function that actually can be solved. But I'm still not giving you any good answers here. So, so you, can, uh, you can do things like you can augment your data. If you believe that your system is rotationally invariant or translationally invariant, like images, mm -hmm. you can take your data set and augment it with more copies of your data that are rotated and translated. Yeah. So you can take, you know, 2,000 images and make it 500,000 images. And that's one way to kind of make in that physical invariance just from the training data. 
And that's basically, I mean, that, that's the traditional industry approach. Just throw more GPUs at it, augment your data, force the system to be have these invariances by just showing it a bunch of invariant data. Um, and then you, you know, your second point was the architecture. You can sometimes build these architectures that have invariances, like you can put Galilean invariant layers at the end, like uh, Julia Ling and her co-authors did for their um, turbulence closure models. In the loss functions, um, this requires some care for how to, how to build in like physical loss functions. So for example, uh, do you expect the divergence of your field to be zero? That's what I wanted to ask uh, next. Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to key in on this one because uh, there's an excellent PhD student, Max, uh, working with my colleague, uh, Arka, in, in ECE here. Um, we're, we're trying to build these deep neural networks for um, Maxwell's equations, for these photonic uh, devices. And we need the divergence of the field to be zero. That's like a physical constraint. We need that to be, uh, to be satisfied. So we're going to explicitly add that into the loss function. We need divergence for your vector fields. And so whatever the solution of E is, it doesn't just have to reproduce the input output dynamics. Mm -hmm. Like that's an important loss function, but equally important is the divergence free condition. And, you know, Max actually tunes these coefficients on in front of these terms so that they are like equally important in the optimization. Mm -hmm. What about the energy conservation? Yeah, so you can definitely um, include energy conservation. The way we do it actually is not through a loss function typically. Usually we enforce energy conservation either by constraining the network itself to have an energy conservational structure like a Hamiltonian, uh, and not just we are, you know, many people across the world are doing this, making these Lagrangian neural networks or these Hamiltonian neural networks. Mm -hmm. um, so the work of uh, Miles Cranmer is some, some of my favorite work um, at Princeton with the, the Google folks, um, Hoyer and Vitalia and others are building these networks that are constrained to have Hamiltonian or Lagrangian structure by construction. And so those are going to conserve energy. Um, the way we do it is actually through constraints that we impose on the optimization. So that's, I think, the fourth step is once you have that loss function, now how are you actually going to solve that optimization problem? You've written down an optimization problem, but we don't necessarily know how to solve it. Um, and so sometimes you can put in these additional constraints. Like I know what some of my coefficients, they have to balance in a certain way for energy conservation. So that's not something I would put in the loss function. I would actually hard constrain that when I'm solving that optimization problem. So I would be solving this uh, optimization subject to constraints of energy conservation. Mm -hmm. So some people, uh, we had it once on the podcast talking about reduced order modeling or reduced order models, which is also one of the chapters in your book. Could you maybe explain in one or two sentences what are ROMs? I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but what are these in general and how can they help you or us in general? Yeah. Yeah, so reduced order models are, um, let, let's think about like, when I look at a movie of a flow field, I can close my eyes and I can picture what it would do forward in time. That's a reduced order model. Mm -hmm. I'm not running maybe your Stokes in my head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing you know, some kind of a reduced order model that's predicting the future. Mm -hmm. And these can be extremely useful. So if I want to do estimation or prediction or control in real engineering systems, like a you know, gas turbine engine or a flow over a Boeing wing or something like that, I need to know what's going to happen very, very quickly. The time scales are ultra compressed. You know, the flow might go from the leading edge to the trailing edge in a fraction of a second on a large scale uh, commercial jet. And so if I'm going to do something to modify that flow, I need to act now. Okay, so the, the lower the latency, the better for control. So I need fast decisions. And they don't have to be perfect decisions. That's the really important point is that for control and for other modeling, you know, and optimization techniques, Often my prediction of the future doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be good enough for control. And so what reduced order models do is they're constantly balancing this accuracy and efficiency trade-off. I want models that are as efficient as possible and as accurate as possible. And these are pulling me in opposite directions. 
I could solve a supercomputer computation of that flow, but it might take me, you know, a million processors six months. So that's not going to cut it for flow control in real time. You know, maybe I can build some cheesy linear model that is blazing fast in terms of two variables, but it's not quite accurate enough to give me the prediction I need to do my control uh, effectively. And so you're trying to find this sweet spot of models that are just complex enough, you know, that they're, they give you the key mechanisms that you need to describe. And they're efficient enough that you can run them in real time for the control or for whatever uh, real time task you're looking for. And so reduced order models, again, you're basically taking your flow, you're trying to distill it into these key coordinates, these key patterns that matter and get just the minimal skeletal model for how those patterns interact either linearly or non-linearly in time. And so that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's kind of the philosophy of reduced order modeling is mm -hmm. to balance accuracy and efficiency to get a good enough answer really, really fast. Mm -hmm. I've heard nobody else ever explaining it in such a good manner. So I appreciate it, Steve. And um, you explained the, uh, or you gave us the example of the uh, turbo machinery from the leading edge to the trailing edge. Um, are there any other engineering concepts or devices where we can use reduced order models? Yeah, absolutely. Um, boy, uh, that, that's a kind of an open-ended set of questions. So, you know, when I give my kind of normal talk in fluid mechanics, I like to start off by just showing a picture of all of these industrial applications of, of fluid dynamics from Uh, from, you know, aircraft, engine, transportation systems, cars, trucks, boats, planes. Uh, so inside the engine, there's opportunities for flow control. Uh, outside the vehicle itself, you know, streamlining a car or a transportation truck that's carrying goods across a continent. You know, you can, these things are vortex shedding. So in Seattle, it rains a lot. And when I'm driving behind an 18-wheeler truck, you can see these sheets of vortex shedding occurring, you know, interacting with the ground. It was all kinds of interesting fluid mechanics happening that is decreasing the efficiency of that, that truck. If you could improve the drag characteristics of transportation trucks by 1%, you would be saving billions of dollars annually. We are living and working inside of a fluid, right? And all, every single one of these, except for space systems, essentially, and, you know, uh, chip manufacturing, we are living inside of a working fluid. So, so for me, flow control is, it's interesting. It's almost like this hidden technological enabler for any science fiction future that you can envision. There's like, it's not going to be the star of the show is flow control, but fluid flow control is going to be behind the scenes working all of the time to give us these little efficiency gains to make things a little bit more agile, a little bit more efficient in transportation in energy conversion and, uh, you know, health. Other examples are um, mixing. So um, if you're creating drugs like uh, aspirin industrially, you're mixing chemicals. Mixing is a very hard fluid process that you might want to enhance. So you're mixing it faster or slower or heat transfer. You know, you might want to increase or decrease the heat transfer. Uh, hypersonic reentry vehicles is a great example where we need flow control, um, very, very fast timescales flow control to make sure that these things don't eject their flame uh, mm -hmm. and kind of like burp out the flame and stall out. Um, wind turbines, underwater uh, turbines in rivers in rural Alaska. I mean, you name it. I think the, the sky's the limit. Flow control is, uh, I think, one of the key technological enablers for many, many trillion dollar industries. Mm -hmm. I think this really was an open-ended question because you gave us la like plenty of examples here. Um, like people having a basic knowledge about turbulence um, modeling in general or turbulence models, we we know about this uh, direct numerical simulation, large LE simulation and runs. If someone wants to make a comparison between, okay, I now have a reduced order model, how much faster is it compared to, let's say, running a runs model? Can we even make this comparison? What would you say? So there are excellent researchers who do these difficult comparisons of, um, you know, really careful benchmarking of how much faster, you know, X method is compared to Y method and not just the methods, but how they scale with grid resolution, how they scale with number of modes, how they scale with Reynolds number. Like there are absolutely uh, very, you know, excellent researchers who, and, and not just, you know, 
showing graphical information, but you know, rigorously quantifying and bounding these things from a, an analysis standpoint so that they can kind of build in guarantees and scaling and things like that, stability. Um, you know, that is, I respect that work very much. That's not what my lab does. Um, so we're glad that those groups exist because that's not a capability that we have really. Um, we are usually trying to go to reduced order models that are so much faster. You could compare them, but it would almost be silly. It's like, uh, you know, we're taking DNS that takes, you know, hours to run and we're getting a model that's an ordinary differential equation in two variables that basically, you know, uh, like, I mean, you could run it on your watch, right? Like, uh, it'd be, well, actually, now watches are pretty fast, but you can, you know, uh, it's the kind of thing. So, so we think a lot about moths and insects and, you know, mosquitoes, flies, things like that, that they have distributed nervous systems. They do have brains, but they actually have local computational groups that spread throughout their body. And they're doing these very complex uh, maneuvers and interacting with very complex fluids on extremely fast time scales with extremely low end minimalistic computational hardware. And so that's kind of the paradigm we're thinking about more is like, what is the sparsest, fastest, most distributed, most low latency way you can take an in information, process that information and make a minimal decision that's informed by kind of what you're sensing and, and modeling in the environment. Um, I totally hijacked your question, by the way. It's fine, it's fine. Um, it's cool. Yeah. Yeah, one thing, because we are, we are already at one hour of the podcast and before we wrap things up, there's also, you post it on Twitter and of course I will post, post the link to your Twitter profile in the description as well so people can follow you there as well as on YouTube, YouTube channel. You mentioned that you will also put up a video on reinforcement learning, which is very oh, yeah. interesting for me. How does reinforcement learning fit into this whole concept or maybe even your book or topics that you are covering? Yeah, so I, I just love reinforcement learning. I think it's it's fascinating. And I, I actually watched um, one of your podcasts. Uh, I think I watched it last night with... Um, Andrew Barto. Andrew Barto. And it was just wonderful. I, I loved hearing his perspective on this. And again, it was this kind of historical perspective uh, bringing things together. Mm. So, you know, I, I'm a bit of a slow... I was a slow adopter of reinforcement learning and also model predictive control. So my, my colleague, Barrett Nowak, uh, again, we work very closely on flow control, turbulence control, things like that. Um, you know, we were working for many years on evolutionary algorithms for flow control. And this was really his kind of main effort, and I was helping. Um, and throughout that process, we had heard about reinforcement learning. We had heard about model predictive control. Um, but it took me a few years to really kind of get into, into those, those fields. Um, I actually think model predictive control is really just phenomenal. I highly, so reinforcement learning is super hot, gets all the citations and attention because it's a machine learning field. I really think that model predictive control is like the unsung hero of industrial control. And, you know, that's the backbone of really advanced control in my opinion is model predictive control. Now, it has a lot of similarities with modern reinforcement learning and there's ways that they can work together and kind of you know, you can blur the lines between them. Um, yeah, so reinforcement learning is becoming a major player in flow control. And this was not true, if you go back, you know, a decade or two, it was a lot less obvious that this was going to be a winning strategy. And it has increasingly become very much uh, a central way that we do flow control. And a lot of this is uh, due to the work of Petros Kumitsakis, and his many excellent uh, students and, and postdocs and collaborators throughout the years. So uh, Petros was a co-author with Barrett and myself on this uh, review paper on machine learning for fluid mechanics. So we've, uh, the three of us have talked a lot about these, these things and I've been fortunate to learn about his work a lot more. Um, he was, and his group were early pioneers of reinforcement learning for flow control problems. So uh, how, you can use reinforcement learning to understand how uh, fish might tail each other uh, for energy efficient transportation or, or, or swimming, things like that. Um, reinforcement learning can be quite expensive. In the most general sense, this is kind of a brute force search strategy. And 
by adding in, you know, better models and better architectures for the reinforcement learning, you can kind of take this brute force and rein it into a smarter search strategy that's more tractable. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that limits, uh, has limited reinforcement learning in the past is that it's very expensive. You need to run lots of simulations, lots of, you know, data and, and trial and error to start building, uh, depending on how you, what your formulation is, you know, start to, to build your policy uh, and estimate what your, uh, your value function is. And so with, you know, these are huge supercomputer computations. I think, you know, like Petros's group's computations are incredibly impressive in scale. If you think about, you know, they're running some of the largest computations out there for computational fluid mechanics. But with that data, they're able to rein this into these really neat, uh, kind of intuitive, compact control, um, you know, reinforcement learning control uh, policies, which are extremely useful. So, yeah, I'm a huge fan. Um, Nathan and I are just got the green light to write a second edition of our book. Wow, nice. And so we're actually going to. I have a paragraph on reinforcement learning. I totally punted uh, and said, "Go read, you know, Sutton and Barto." <laughs> and so. In the newer version of the book, we're going to really dive into reinforcement learning more and model predictive control and really kind of build out that more modern uh, control. This is great. Then also probably with code examples in Python and MATLAB to do your own reinforcement learning research, quote unquote. Yeah, I think so. Um, and it's that, that's a decision we have to make. So definitely uh, the second version is going to be you know in Python and in MATLAB, so two versions basically. Okay. Um, so you can pick whichever one you want because mm -hmm. I think everyone wants Python basically uh, at this point. But there's a question about, um, do you focus on build your own RL code or do you focus on the industry standard RL environments like the OpenAI gym and things yeah. like that? Really a tough one. Um, you know, Nathan and I have thought a lot about this because we're, um, we're also, you know, thinking about this kind of deep learning for fluids set of lectures these codes are so complicated. We could fill a whole book just with one code. <laughs> so instead of, you know, building that code from scratch, we're probably going to take the route of really telling the user how to work with existing large scale codes and how to modify and how to analyze and interpret and things like that. Instead of, you know, our first data book, it's really like line by line. How do you build a, an SVD? How do you build a PCA? Things like that. This is probably going to be more, zoomed out looking at these large scale codes and environments. Mm -hmm. Great. I can't wait to, to see that course. You would basically be the first ones, you and Nathan, creating such a course, right? Deep learning, especially for fluid mechanics? I think so. Um, there's a few kind of data-driven fluids projects that are brewing across the, the world right now um, that I'm aware of. Um, and I think this, to my knowledge, this is the first really deep learning for fluids one. Um, very much focused on, you know, what can these arbitrarily powerful representations do for fluids. Awesome. Um, so we're, we're excited. Like we think that's going to be a big opportunity. Great. So before we wrap things up, Steve, is there anything else before we jump to the so-called question rampage, how I like to call it? So I have 15 questions for you prepared and uh, optimally you would answer them in one sentence or, okay. with, or with one word, however you want. Do you and want I to say anything else? You, uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. You can, you can answer them even in two sentences if you want. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say, tell the audience before we jump to the question rampage? Maybe I have to fix the name. Yeah, I mean, so I think it's super important to choose the people you work with carefully. I am so fortunate to have amazing students and amazing collaborators and colleagues. And so I think, you know, you really are the sum or the average of the people that you surround yourself with. And so work to be fortunate <laughs> with the people that you're surrounded with. Like I always wake up happy because I get to work with great people. Um, so that's, you know, for me, very, uh, very encouraging. Um, the other bit I would say is in my career, I've always looked, I've always been listening for when someone I respect says, you know, they're giving a talk And then there's an aside, oh, and we can't solve this. This is an unsolved problem, or this is an open challenge, or even better, this is the holy grail of this field. Mm. If you ever hear that, like, just file that for later, because those are the most interesting problems. Like, I, I think having the confidence that we as a community in this generation can actually advance problems that were previously unsolvable, 
grand challenge, holy grail problems. You know, it's really uh, empowering and it also makes research much more fun. Like it means you're working on problems that really matter. Maybe you don't solve that holy grail, but if you figure out what the sub problems are and the sub problems there, you're working towards something that lots of people care about that is actually going to matter. And for me, that's been just very, very motivating. I can remember three or four times where, whether it was Marsden or Rowley or, you know, other people have said, you know, in passing, oh, you know, optimal sensor placement, that's a brute force NP hard problem or uh, nonlinear system identification. Like that's one of the, you know, open challenges of dynamical systems. That's what I want to work on. And so I just want to encourage you to think about like what is really hard, but everyone would be super happy if you solved it. Absolutely. Is, is it also maybe a hint that you want to solve the Millennium Prize problem for the Navier-Stokes equation? <laughs> uh, so I don't think that one is... Uh, yeah, so when I was a kid, actually, I thought that was super cool that there were these Millennium problems, and I loved thinking about them. Um, again, now that I've grown up a little bit, I realize that that's more of a pure math problem <laughs> um, and less of an applied problem. But actually, there's some cool stuff Terry Tao put out a while back. Like, he's really pushing hard on this, um, this um, you know, Navier-Stokes Millennium problems. So that's pretty interesting, yeah. you know, as an amateur kind of hobbyist looking in to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I also have to mention again that the work you and also Nathan are doing is really inspiring and also pushes me as an engineer forward to maybe see concepts from another perspective, maybe. So I really appreciate you having uh, or spreading the knowledge around the world and having this altruistic view of even providing the book for free, which is, I think, an awesome, awesome thing to do. Well, thank you. So, so I really appreciate it. And um, so now to the question rampage. I've, as I mentioned, 15 questions prepared for you, Steve. And as you want, you can give me one word answers or maybe two sentence, one sentence answers. Question number one would be, what are you most proud of? Uh, my students, definitely. Great. Question number two, are you a turbulent person? No pun intended. Uh, yeah, I, I fundamentally love chaos and the amplification of initial conditions. You can go in any direction with a very small perturbation if you're near a saddle point. So yes. Great answer. Question number three, your biggest inspiration? Uh, definitely my parents, yeah. Awesome. Best mentor you ever had? Uh, Nathan Kutz. Best tip to work on a hard task productively? So you have to take things one step at a time and be organized with your time management. Um, just don't write down goals that are solve the problem. Write down goals like spend one hour thinking about the problem because you can definitely achieve the second goal, even if the first one seems uh, intractable. Great advice. Favorite operating system? Oh, Mac OS. Nice. If you could spend one day with a celebrity, who would it be? Uh, maybe Carl Sagan. I don't know. Dead or alive? Both. Both is fine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would like to meet Carl Sagan. Favorite app on your phone? Um, I try to like not use it <laughs> that much, I guess, Safari. <laughs> <laughs> um, video from your YouTube channel you enjoyed filming the most? The machine learning in fluids was really fun. Um, I was really excited about it. I was super pumped to kind of get it out into the world. I thought people would like it, so that was really fun. Absolutely. And uh, regarding this question, which was a video you didn't enjoy at all filming? Was there one? Oh my God. Uh, well, so there's always hiccups. I remember one time I came into the studio on the weekend between two international trips. I had two days and I spent all of one day trying to film. And I realized uh, when I got there that the studio was partially disassembled. And then I got through my filming and three hours later, I realized my microphone wasn't on. Oh. <laughs> and I don't remember which video this was, but there are a few videos where if you look closely, I'm probably cussing under my breath. <laughs> okay. Um, favorite programming language? I mean, honestly, I love C++. I think it really was a game changer for me. Um, nowadays, you know, it's got to be Python, but uh, I have a special place in my heart for C++. Great. Favorite movie? Oh, there's too many good ones. Uh, like, I love Pulp Fiction. 
my kids and I love uh, the fantastic Mr. Fox. Mm -hmm. Great. Who will win the AI race? Like Which a person? Country. Oh, country. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, I'm, I'm very much biased, um, but I think that we and the U.S. have an incredible magnet for talent, mm -hmm. and we have a great environment where people can take risks and get really, you know, we have this balance of being able to take risks, but also getting great rewards for those risks when they pay out. And I think if we keep trying to do things right, uh, we've got a shot. Like, obviously, you know, there's other countries that are going to give us a run for our money. Mm -hmm. I'm also not sure that, I'm not sure that this is so much a race. Like, this is inevitable. The world is going to be, you know, increasingly transformed, and it's going to happen in all countries. Mm -hmm. Assuming AGI will be possible within five to ten years, what is the first question you ask an AGI system? What makes you happy? Great. One superpower you would like to have? Oh, wow. Uh, that's, that's too much. Uh, this is like one of the questions my, kid, my kids <laughs> ask me. Um, so it would be fun to be able to run really fast like, uh, like the Flash. Mm -hmm. And last question. If you were a superhero, what would your name be? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, well, so it would have to be alliterative. Um, Probably Eigen Steve. I'm going to stick with Eigen Steve. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out for the nerds. That's, <laughs> that's a great one. Um, Steve, I really much appreciate your time. And maybe that once you pu publish the second book, there can be a second podcast, especially about reinforcement learning and all the topics we have covered today. Uh, looking forward to that. I really much appreciate you being on the show and sharing the knowledge with the world. So I hope you reach the 1 million subs this year. I I'm pushing for it. I'm trying my best. Um, yeah. So is there anything else you would like to tell the audience in general? Uh, well, first off, thank you so much. Um, really glad to be here, and I just really appreciate um, your time and, and the questions. It's been a lot of fun from my side. And yeah, just uh, everyone watching, thank you. I uh, hope stay interested in interesting things, right? Like, uh, yeah, there's everything is interesting if you think about it enough, I think. Great. Take care, Steve. All right. Thanks again. Take care.